This video is about how our conventional moral duties or obligations, that is, the moral rules that we ascribe to others and ourselves, can actually be understood as a more general moral obligation to increase loyalty in the world. In other words, obligations like telling the truth, not hurting others, being kind, can actually be understood as a requirement to increase the overall amount of loyalty in the world, which is to increase the willing and thoroughgoing and practical commitments of people to whatever their cause might be. Since this video concerns the relationship of moral duties to loyalty, and in particular, increasing loyalty in the world, it, it depends upon a, a number of videos that occurred earlier in this series. These are videos that actually define what loyalty is. They discuss loyalty as a prudential good, and also the ethics of loyalty, the moral rules surrounding this notion of loyalty. So as such, I would recommend the videos that occur earlier in this series that deal with defining what loyalty is, loyalty as a prudential good, and the ethics surrounding loyalty. I'll put the links to all of these videos in the description below. So let's get clear about what the thesis is of this video. The thesis is that all moral duties, rules, obligations, can be understood in terms of a more general moral commitment. That moral commitment is to increase loyalty in the world, or again, as the philosopher Josiah Royce puts it, to have a loyalty to loyalty. So a couple observations. The first is that if we were gonna to try to prove this particular thesis, it looks like the proof would be pretty big because what it seems like it would require is going through each and every one of our moral rules and then showing how, well, this particular moral rule that's out there actually can be explained in terms of a moral rule to increase loyalty. And this one over here is can also be understood in terms of a requirement to increase loyalty in the world. And so you'd go through all of the moral rules and then show how they can all be understood in terms of this more general moral commitment. But if there are a lot of moral rules, then it's going to be a difficult or at least a pretty long proof to give. So the proof that Royce gives is more in terms of examples. He shows a couple examples about how certain moral rules can be understood in terms of this commitment to increase loyalty in the world. And then I'll talk about some general moral obligations, particularly sort of moral duties you have to yourself and how all of these can be understood in terms of a requirement to increase loyalty in the world. So we'll look at some of the examples that he gives in order to get a clear sense of how a more exhaustive proof might be done. A second observation that I might make, though, is, is more practical in nature. Because you might say, well, why do I even care? I have my moral rules. They're kind of scattered all over the place. And, you know, why do I need to understand these particular moral rules that I have in terms of something more general? Well, I think one reason you might want to is because it helps you better understand the moral rules that you have. Because as such, a lot of people, I think, just have a set of moral rules. And then if they're asked, like, what connects them? What's common to them? What holds them all together? They really don't have a very good answer to this. And so the reason we'd want to understand all of the moral rules that we have in terms of this more general commitment is because it gives us a clear sense of what holds them all together, what systematizes them, what brings them into unity or what common characteristic they all have. In other words, a moral self-reflection isn't necessarily a bad thing, and it can give you a greater sense of understanding about yourself and your own moral commitments. A third observation concerning this, and it relates to the second observation, is Understanding the foundation or the common core of all your moral commitments can also help you determine when those moral rules that you have don't apply. In other words, it helps us determine the scope or range of applicability of those moral rules. So the idea is that we understand our moral rules in terms of something more basic, a more basic general moral commitment. And this is the commitment to increase loyalty in the world. So this helps us know when we should and should not apply certain moral rules that we have that we all know, like be honest or be kind. We should only apply it when doing so would increase the overall amount of loyalty in the world. And we might postpone or not apply it when it actually decreases loyalty in the world or perhaps has no effect on things. To put it simply, if you're only supposed to apply a certain moral rule when it increases loyalty in the world, then you know when the moral rule applies, and you'll know when there's an exception to the moral rule. 
So let's look at an example how this might be done. And the example we'll look at is the moral obligation to tell the truth or to be honest. To me, what loyalty means is actually honesty. So the moral obligation to tell the truth or to be honest applies only when doing so would increase the overall amount of loyalty in the world. If telling the truth or being honest didn't increase loyalty in the world or decrease loyalty in the world, then you're not under any moral commitment to be honest in those circumstances. So let's look at an example of this. So let's say you and I both want something. We want to do a business transaction or we want to meet at a certain date and time or we want to exchange information because we're both working on an important research project. So in interacting with each other, we have a shared cause. That is to do successful business or to have a social gathering or to, you know, advance our research. So in having this shared cause and being loyal to the same cause, Roy says that we have an obligation to tell the truth, given the fact that we have this commitment to this shared cause. So the question becomes, why do we have an obligation to tell the truth? Royce gives us a clear answer. He says that the reason we have an obligation to tell the truth is because failure to do so would result in a decrease in the amount of loyalty in the world. Because if you lie to me concerning our business transaction or where we're going to meet or the information that is important for our research project, then this decreases my capacity to serve my cause. If I'm working towards this successful business endeavor or meeting or this research project, then I need to count on you. And my actions are directed at achieving the cause associated with these endeavors. But if I have to kind of always second guess you, because I don't know if you are lying to me, then my capacity to achieve these goals is undermined. It's weakened. I can no longer do it as successfully. So the idea here is that the reason we have an obligation to be honest is because doing so allows for an increase of loyalty in the world, a better capacity of human beings to serve their causes, whereas lying actually decreases our capacity to serve those causes and so, given an increase of loyalty in the world is good for Royce and a decrease of loyalty is bad, this explains why we have an obligation in certain circumstances to tell the truth versus not tell the truth. Royce says that this is a kind of case where we, two individuals, have a shared cause or a shared loyalty and why we need to tell the truth in order to prevent the decrease in loyalty in our, the person that we're dealing with. But he also points to more general considerations about why we have an obligation to tell the truth. One is, is if we encounter individuals that are lying to us, Royce thinks that this actually causes us to lose confidence in humanity. And this loss of confidence in humanity causes us to sort of weaken our capacity to s serve certain goals. On the other hand, telling the truth actually increases our confidence in human beings. If we are constantly encountered with people that are honest with us, then we feel, yeah, I can count on my fellow individual, my neighbor here and there, and I don't have to kind of constantly doubt what they're saying and say, hmm, are they being honest with me? To this effect, Royce writes, but whoever speaks the truth thereby does what he then can to help everybody to speak the truth. For he acts so as to further the general confidence of man in man. How far such an indirect influence may extend, no man can predict. I'd say there's some truth to this, at least from a personal perspective. When I deal with individuals that are honest... I don't have to kind of think about, oh, is this person telling me the truth? And I don't have to manage, on the one hand, what might be the case if they lie to me and the task that I'm trying to actually accomplish. Instead, I can just directly focus on the particular cause or tasks at hand. But when you're around people that lie or are unreliable or give you false information, at least for me, you feel like you're confident... You're torn in two directions. On the one hand, you're dealing with the mess of them and whether or not you can count on them or whether they're telling you the truth or, and also like the thing that you actually have to do. I also think this is a kind of cool idea because a lot of times we think about these moral rules that if you violate the moral rule, then you have done something wrong. But merely adhering to the moral rule doesn't give you any points. It doesn't mean you've done something good. You've just fulfilled your obligation. In Royce's perspective, 
Actually telling the truth actually makes the world better. Being honest in reasonable circumstances actually makes the world better, a better place because you increase the overall amount of confidence that each individual has in other individuals. So just to summarize, Royce thinks that we can understand the obligation to be honest in terms of the obligation to increase loyalty in the world. We have an obligation to be honest because it increases loyalty in the world and failure to do so, that is when you lie, you actually decrease loyalty in the world. A final point concerning this example involving honesty is that understanding when you should and shouldn't be honest and that you need to be honest in certain circumstances in terms of whether or not you are increasing or decreasing loyalty has certain practical benefits that I had mentioned earlier. One of those benefits has to do with the scope of when these rules apply. So Roy says that one of the reasons you should be honest is because it increases the overall amount of confidence that you can have in your fellow human being. And this allows you to focus on your primary tasks or be loyal to those primary tasks. So this allows us to get a clearer sense of the scope of the, our obligation. If I am under duress or being coerced or tortured or kidnapped, uh, and I lie to my torturer or kidnapper, no one is going to lose faith in humanity or their fellow individual because of this lie. And since it's not going to decrease the overall amount of confidence that we have in our fellow human being, it doesn't result in a decrease of loyalty in the world. People aren't going to doubt my word here on out because I lied to my kidnapper or lied to my torturer. And so the lie is acceptable in this circumstance because it doesn't have a negative effect on the overall amount of loyalty in the world. Another example of this that's less extreme than that one is when we play tricks or jokes on individuals, provided we don't do it too much. Uh, I think when we play a one-off trick on someone where you lie to them in some way, shape, or form, since this doesn't decrease the overall amount of loyalty in the world, they're not going to have their faith shaken in you from here on out in serious matters. I think Royce would say since the effect of lying in this joking circumstance doesn't decrease loyalty in the world, it's perfectly acceptable to lie when you're playing a prank on someone. Now, I think if you're constantly playing pranks on people, then people are going to kind of doubt whether or not what you're doing is a prank and they can't take you, rely upon your word in serious circumstances. So a certain excess of jokes and pranks might not be morally acceptable. But I think, you know, an occasional one is perfectly morally fine because it doesn't damage our faith in our fellow human being and therefore doesn't decrease loyalty in the world. Royce considers several more examples. He considers things like commercial fidelity, like the responsibility of the financial sector to report properly upon their business dealings, uh, things that have to do with rights, like the right to life, right to free speech, right to property, as well as the notion of justice. And then his line of reasoning is similar throughout. He shows how all three of these items can be understood in terms of a commitment to increase loyalty in the world, but in the remainder of this video, I want to focus on two principal moral obligations and how they can be understood in terms of a general commitment to increase loyalty in the world. The first has to do with duties to yourself, uh, a kind of moral obligation that sometimes people are skeptical about. And the second has to do with benevolence or kindness to others. So the first kind of moral obligation I want to look at has to do with duties to yourself. These are duties like the, to take care of your body, to become increasingly educated or skilled in a certain area, um, to develop your sort of cognitive abilities, to become more autonomous that is self-controlled, and maybe even to get in touch with your spiritual or religious side. Now, I'm not saying that all of these moral obligations exist, but they're generally out there. Some people will assert them to be the case. For Royce, if they are out there, if we do have duties to ourself, then we should understand them in terms of this more general commitment to increase loyalty in the world. So the big challenge is, can you understand moral duties to the self in terms of Royce's ethics of loyalty? The logic of Royce's argument is pretty straightforward. We have a moral obligation to increase the overall amount of loyalty in the world. Well, what does that require? For loyalty to exist in the world, we need individuals that have a cause that they are willingly and thoroughgoingly and most importantly, practically committed to. What this practical component involves is the capacity to act in service of the cause. 
So if my goal is to educate, then I need to take action in order to instantiate or make real that particular cause. So if loyalty requires practical action, then in order to increase more loyalty in the world, we need to take care of ourselves. And, and in fact, we need to improve ourselves to the extent that doing so would allow us to create more loyalty in the world. So the short of it is that we're better able to serve our causes, that is to increase the amount of loyalty in the world through our practical actions. If we're healthy, fit, educated, and maybe in touch with our spiritual selves. So Royce would say you have a moral obligation to yourself, to taking care of yourself, to improving yourself, to the degree that it would increase more loyalty in the world. That is, increase your capacity to realize your purpose or to instantiate or make real the cause to which you're loyal. I think the interesting part about this, though, is that we have to take care of ourselves because loyalty requires practical action. But the degree to which we need to take care of ourselves or the moral obligations we have to ourselves is going to vary depending upon what our personal cause is, the cause to which we're loyal. The elite athlete might have to take better care of themselves and might have a greater moral responsibility to personal physical care than, let's say, the educator, because their cause is different than the educators. The elite athlete's cause is, let's say, winning a title, and they have commitments to their teammates in because they're collectively aiming to serve this cause. And actually serving the cause requires more personal or physical maintenance, whereas the educator might have maybe a moral obligation to be healthy, but not be in peak physical fitness. Another example that I think might apply has to do with unconscious bias or outside influences that might corrupt an individual's judgment. So if you take politicians or judges or even educators, you want to be on guard in order to serve your purpose of judging a case effectively, grading a paper effectively, or serving one's constituency fairly. You wanna make sure that outside influences don't corrupt your judgment, that don't influence you in a way that keeps you from effectively serving your cause. So here the claim would be that you have a moral duty to develop yourself, your cognitive apparatus, in a way that keeps you from being exposed to or influenced by those outside or corrupting forces. Not only do you have a moral obligation to, let's say, others, because if you judge a case incorrectly, that's going to damage people's capacity to fulfill their causes and therefore decrease loyalty in the world. But you also have a commitment to yourself because if you want to serve your cause effectively, if you want to judge that case objectively or serve your constituents fairly, then you have an obligation to do it in an effective way. You have to increase your practical capacity to try to realize that particular goal. And these outside corrupting influences get in the way of your capacity to realize those goals. So we can understand these commitments to ourselves, these moral obligations I have to me in terms of this more general commitment, moral obligation to increase loyalty in the world. The reason I have an obligation to myself is because I have an obligation to serve my cause. And this requires practical action. And so, since I'm the one practically serving the cause, I need to develop myself, not only mentally, but also physically, to the point where I can most effectively increase loyalty in the world. That is, most effectively serve that cause or realize that purpose. I also mentioned Josiah Royce, because a long time ago, my father spoke to me about him and his philosophy of loyalty. I didn't really grasp its importance, but as I look back now, I understand how this loyalty to California was my father's philosophy as well. It drove him to build our freeways, our universities, our public schools, and our state water plan. So the last moral duty I want to take a look at has to do with benevolence, or the moral obligation to be kind to other individuals. So for Royce, remember, you have a moral obligation to increase loyalty in the world, as well as the opportunities for loyalty. Since other individuals are capable of being loyal, that is, they can increase the overall amount of loyalty in the world, their welfare should concern us. We can't be dismissive of their loyalty, we can't disregard it, and we shouldn't be evil to them, because every single human being is capable of increasing the overall amount of loyalty in the world. 
In other words, we should be kind to other people. We should be considerate, benevolent, because everyone is an instrument or a means of increasing the overall amount of loyalty in the world. So for us, there's not a blanket or universal requirement to be kind to other individuals. You're kind because those individuals are an instrument of increasing loyalty in the world. So if people are hurting or in pain, well, they can't instantiate or be loyal to their cause. They're too preoccupied with their suffering. So we have a moral obligation to alleviate their suffering so that they can actually serve the cause. And this results in an increase of loyalty. But you don't have to be nice for nice's sake, or you don't have to be concerned with people's feelings or condition just for the sake of it. There's nothing intrinsically important about it for Royce. Instead, you want to help people so that they can realize their purpose, so they can get about the task of their lives. Not because, you know, of certain rules of etiquette or something like that. As an observation, I think this has a lot of serious practical effects. One would be that Royce would say that, you know, the individuals, we ought to provide them some means of health care. We want to make sure that the population as a whole is healthy because we have a moral obligation to get those individuals focused on the purpose of, of their lives. That is, we need to have those people healthy so that they can increase the overall amount of loyalty in the world. Another implication is that since you have an obligation to increase loyalty in the world, and since human welfare is connected to that loyalty, you cannot simply have a cause that is destructive of other individuals, that takes advantage of them, or that's predatory, or that decreases their capacity to be loyal. So in this video, we looked at Josiah Royce's thesis that conventional moral rules or obligations can be understood in terms of a more general moral obligation. And that moral obligation is to increase loyalty in the world. In particular, we looked at some examples about the moral rule to be honest, to be kind or benevolent, to be concerned with people's welfare, as well as duties to oneself, like taking care of your body or cultivating your cognitive capacities. And we looked at how these could be understood as a special instance of a general commitment to increase loyalty in the world, or as Royce puts it, to be loyal to loyalty. Thank you.